If there was a definition for emphatic rejection, it would be a video of a Ben Wallace block. When he sent your shot away, he was sending a message that nothing would be easy. As an undersized center, he became one of the best defensive players to lace them up, as he put together one of the greatest stretches of all time. His timing and discipline allowed him to be an effective defender on the league's best, and he was recognized for it by capturing a record-tying four DPOI awards. Without him, the Pistons don't win the 0-4 title and overall don't have nearly the success they had during the 2000s. He never looked like the same player once he left Detroit, but he was still giving you everything he had whenever he was on the floor. Never an offensive threat, and arguably the worst free throw shooter of all time, Ben Wallace did everything and more on the defensive end, and made up for his offensive shortcomings by being the best on the offensive glass year after year. But when it comes to Big Ben, it's not so much that he's forgotten, it's that he's underappreciated for just how dominant he was in his prime. So that's why we're going to look at his entire run on today's episode. Let's jog your memory. An Alabama native, Ben Wallace developed his play style as the youngest of eight boys, as it was the only way he was going to get the ball. Wallace attended Central High School in Hainville, Alabama, where he was a multiple sport athlete during his time there, earning all state in basketball, baseball, and football as a senior. But it was during summer leading up to his junior year that he made the most important connection of his life. While attending a summer basketball camp, he was messing around during a lecture being given by then Knicks forward Charles Oakley. So to teach him a lesson, Oakley called him out to play a game of one-on-one. -on -one. Oakley called all the campers soft, but after seeing how hard the 6'4", 170 pound Wallace played, he had earned Oakley's respect as the two were bleeding once the game was over and Oakley would become Wallace's mentor. By his senior year of high school, Wallace was being heavily recruited, but it wasn't on the hardwood, it was on the gridiron, as a star linebacker. Wallace hadn't received any scholarship offers to play basketball, so he made it clear that any school that signed him to play football would have to allow him to play basketball as well. Wallace eventually committed to Auburn University, but when the coaches wouldn't allow him to play basketball, he rescinded his commitment. But now he didn't know what to do, but luckily, Oakley stepped in. Oakley would talk to a coach at Cuyahoga Community College in Cleveland as they had an empty roster spot. And with Oakley vouching for him, Wallace would be playing for the Challengers going into his 93 freshman season. By his sophomore year, he was reportedly averaging 24 points, 17 rebounds, and 7 blocks per game, as it was only a matter of time until he'd be playing D1 ball. But Wallace made a head-scratching decision by dropping out of school before the end of his sophomore year. But Oakley must have really wanted to see Wallace succeed as once again he would step in and speak to the coach at his alma mater, Division II Virginia Union. So Wallace would spend his junior and senior seasons at Virginia Union under coach Dave Robbins. The Panthers already featured capable scorers, so Wallace would take on the role which led to a Hall of Fame NBA career by becoming a defender, rebounder, and all-around bruising force. Wallace would help lead the team to the 95 CIAA title, and the Panthers would do it again in 96 as well as reach the Division II Final Four. On top of that, during his 96 senior season, Wallace would average 12.5 points, 10.5 rebounds, and 3.7 blocks per game for a 28-3 Panthers team. He would graduate and declare for the NBA draft, however this time, Oakley couldn't help him, and he would go undrafted in the legendary 96 draft. Wallace would latch on with the Celtics for the 96 Summer League, but wouldn't make the team. He would then sign with an Italian team and play one game for them before getting a call from another all-time great yet undersized big man who happened to be the GM of the Washington Bullets in Wes Unseld, who saw a lot of himself in Wallace and decided to take a chance on the rookie. Wallace would join a Washington Bullets team featuring the newly acquired Rod Strickland and their star forward duo of Chris Webber and Juwan Howard. Although Wallace would spend most of his time on the bench this year, only appearing in 34 games, Webber and Howard would reportedly both sing his praises for how hard he went at them in practice. The Bullets would have one of their best seasons in years, as their 44-38 record would earn them their first playoff appearance since 1988, but Wallace would not see the floor during the postseason and would end up being a first round loss to Chicago, and Wallace's regular season would see him average about 1 point, 1.5 and a half rebounds, and half a block per game. Going into 98, the now Washington Wizards had their same core of Strickland, Weber, and Howard, but they had lost center George Murison to injury for the entire year, and without him, Wallace was able to go from about 6 minutes per game as a rookie to almost 17 per game in year 2, and he was making the most of his increased playing time. In 67 games with 16 starts, 
he would record double figure rebounds in 10 of them and would have a game with seven blocks in an April 17th win versus Miami. But something else that began this year was Wallace's trademark afro, as reportedly he, Weber, and Darvin Ham had a bet going to see whose hair would grow longest over the course of the year, which Wallace would clearly win. The Wizards would put up a similar record this year at 42 and 40, but it wouldn't be enough for the playoffs. And for the regular season, Wallace put up about three points, five rebounds, and a block and steal per game. However, during the 98 playoffs, a trade had been completed that saw Washington send Weber to Sacramento for a package headlined by their aging star, Mitch Richmond. Although Richmond had been a perennial all-star throughout the 90s, he was 33 years old and was on the decline. The lockout had also occurred this summer, so the season was shortened to 50 games, and Wallace would play in 46 of them, starting 16 of them, and acting as one of the team's top bench players, as he received nearly 27 minutes per game. Coming off the bench, Wallace would lead the team in rebounding and blocks, as he would be top 20 in both categories, while also shooting a career-high 57.8%. He would have 15 games with at least 10 rebounds, and 4 games with at least 5 blocks. But the Wizards really felt the loss of Weber, and with Howard missing 16 games this year, along with other players showing big dips in their production, Washington only managed an 18-32 record and missed the playoffs. And for the regular season, Wallace put up about 6 points, 8.5 rebounds, 1 steal, and 2 blocks per game. The Wizards would decide to move on from Wallace, as they shipped him to Orlando during the offseason. But this is where Wallace would finally get a real opportunity. The Magic featured a first-year head coach in Doc Rivers, and had just lost their franchise star to the Phoenix Suns, as they were now a young and inexperienced team looking for direction. Rivers would start Wallace at power forward all year, and even though he was receiving over two less minutes than last year, he was putting up similar numbers, as he would again be a top 20 rebounder in the league. But where he was really setting himself apart was as a defender, as 2000 would mark the first of eight straight years of Wallace ranking in the top 10 for defensive rating. As he finished with the 8th lowest mark this year, Wallace would have 25 games with double digit rebounds, 6 double doubles, and 2 games with at least 20 boards, while also blocking at least 4 shots in 10 games. And he did all of this while suffering from bone spurs all year, which caused him to wear a walking cast between games. The Magic were expected to be one of, if not the worst team in the league, but surprised everyone by finishing at 41 and 41, as Doc Rivers would be named coach of the year. However, their 500 record was still not enough for a playoff berth, and for the regular season, Wallace put up about 5 points, 8 rebounds, 1 steal, and 1.5 and blocks per game. Wallace again had a new home going into the 01 season, but this time he'd be staying for a while. Over the summer, Wallace was one of the players included in the sign-in trade, which saw the Magic acquire all-star Grant Hill from Detroit. At the time, it seemed like a one-sided trade, as Hill was considered a top talent in the league and Wallace and Chucky Atkins were looked at more as role players. And it did still end up being a robbery, but it was Detroit who made out like bandits. Similar to the Magic a year ago, Detroit was looking for direction. They did feature a high-scoring shooting guard in Jerry Stackhouse, who would go on to have the best season of his career this year. The Pistons had picked up some solid players like Joe Smith, who had been declared a free agent by the league after a salary cap evasion situation occurred with him in Minnesota. Additionally, the team would acquire a tough forward from Toronto at the trade deadline in Corliss Williamson. So Stackhouse had the offensive side of the ball covered, but they needed a defensive anchor. And Wallace showed he was more than qualified for that role. Wallace would get over 34 minutes per game as he would finish as the league's second best rebounder with the second most offensive rebounds as well. As he would have a career high 12 offensive rebounds in a March 30th win versus Orlando. He would also be in the top 10 in blocks per game and he would have a top 5 defensive rating this year. Wallace would have at least 10 rebounds in 61 games, 10 games with at least 20 boards, and his career high of 28 rebounds in an April 17th loss to Toronto. And he would also record 23 games with at least 4 blocks. Although Wallace was a great start on defense, he couldn't do it all, as the Pistons had a bottom 5 scoring defense. And along with a middle of the pack offense, they would finish at 32-50 and, and miss the playoffs. And for the regular season, Wallace put up about 6.5 points, 13 rebounds, 1.5 steals, and 2.5 blocks per game. The 0-2 Pistons would get a full year out of Corliss Williamson, who would put together a great year off the bench, winning 6th man of the year. They would also bring in some veteran help in the form of forward Clifford Robinson, but they also brought in a new man to lead the team, in head coach Rick Carlisle, as he would even end up winning coach of the year. Stackhouse was still the team's top scorer, but his points had dropped by over 8 per game and he was shooting below 
but as Stackhouse took a step back, Wallace took a step forward. A 27-year-old Wallace would lead the league in rebounds and blocks per game, while finishing second in offensive rebounds, as well as top 15 in steals. He now boasted the top defensive rating in the league, and if it wasn't already clear that he was the league's best defender, then a first-team all-defense selection and Defensive Player of the Year award made it certain. And on top of his great defensive play, his 7.6 points per game were a then-career high, and his shooting was above 53%. Wallace would score in double figures in 26 games and pull down double figure rebounds in 65 games, including 5 games with at least 20 rebounds and a career high tying 28 boards in a March 24th victory over Boston. He would have 17 games with at least 3 steals and 37 games with at least 4 blocks, including a career high 10 blocks to go along with 10 points and 17 rebounds in his only triple double of the year in a February 24th loss to Milwaukee, as he would also be named third team All NBA and he almost took home some more hardware, finishing second in most improved player voting. As a team, the Pistons had the sixth best scoring defense and rode that to a 50 and 32 record. And although this wasn't Wallace's first playoff appearance, it would be the first time he saw the court during the postseason. Wallace wasted no time making his mark, as in game one of a first round matchup versus Toronto, he had 19 points, 20 rebounds, three steals and three blocks in a win. He was never able to replicate his scoring output, but he continued his great rebounding and defensive play, as he would have at least 11 rebounds in each game and averaged 15 for the five-game series, while also averaging over two steals and two blocks per game. The Pistons would win in five to advance to the second round, where they would take on the Boston Celtics. This series would also be over in five games, but it was due to a gentleman's sweep from Boston. The Pistons' offense as a whole couldn't get anything going, shooting about 38% for the series. But Wallace continued doing what he does best, as he had at least 12 rebounds in each game and would have back-to-back -back games with 21 rebounds, including a 12 and 21 game three. As overall for the series, he averaged 17 rebounds and three blocks per game. And for the regular season, he averaged about seven and a half points, 13 rebounds, a career high three and a half blocks, and one and a half steals per game. So the Pistons were on the right track, but they needed more pieces. And they would get a few of those going into 2003. First, the Pistons would select Kentucky forward Tayshaun Prince with the 23rd pick in the 0-2 draft. Then on July 17th, they would sign free agent point guard Chauncey Billups to be their new floor general. And lastly, in what was the most surprising move, Detroit sent a package headlined by Stackhouse to the Wizards a couple months before the season for a package headlined by their young shooting guard, Richard Hamilton. And even though it wouldn't be until next year that Prince began making a real impact, Detroit had completely changed the identity and future of their team in just a couple months. The Pistons' new backcourt made an immediate impact, and they would get another good season out of both Robinson and Williamson. But the Pistons were scoring less, as they had fallen to a bottom 5 scoring offense in the league, but now had the league's best scoring defense. Wallace would again lead the league in rebounding on a career-high 15.4 per game, and his 293 offensive rebounds would also lead the league. He was still averaging over three blocks per game and would finish second in the league in that category, as well as finish with the league's best defensive rating for the second straight year. He would be second team all NBA and first team all defense and win his second consecutive DPOY. He would have 64 games with at least 10 rebounds, 16 games with at least 20 rebounds, 17 double doubles, and another points, rebounds, blocks, triple double, as he would also have 27 games with at least four blocks. The great year from Wallace would also see him selected to his first career All-Star game. Unfortunately, he would be playing with a heavy heart. Hearts go out to Ben Wallace. It's been a very tough week uh, for the young Detroit Pistons center because he had planned to get here Thursday and enjoy everything that goes along with All-Star weekend. Last weekend, his mother Sadie died, and so he spent last weekend in Alabama, Whitehall. The Alabama. Pistons would go on a seven-game losing streak shortly after the All-Star break, but would be able to recover and overall finish the year at 50 and 32 as they would have a first round matchup versus Orlando. Wallace had missed the final eight games of the year with a knee injury, which was feared to keep him out for the beginning of the playoffs. But he would be in the lineup game one, where he would play over 42 minutes with 13 rebounds and three blocks in a loss. He would have 10 and 16 with three blocks in a game two win, but then Detroit would drop the next two, even though Wallace was averaging 10 points and 23 rebounds and would have seven steals in game four. Detroit would get it together the rest of the way and win the next three games by blowouts as Wallace would average over 13 points, 16 rebounds, nearly three and a half steals, and over four and a half blocks per game in games five through seven. The second round brought the Sixers, and after hitting double figures in three games of the first round, Wallace would only do so once this round, 
and would have his only game of the postseason with single-digit rebounds in a Game 3 loss. But when it was all said and done, he still pulled down nearly 14 rebounds while recording more than two steals and blocks per game, as the Pistons won the series in six to move on to their first conference finals appearance since 1991. The defending Eastern Conference champion Nets were waiting for them, and they would end up outplaying the Pistons. The first two games in Detroit would each end in two-point Piston losses, and then the next two games in New Jersey would end in blowout defeats, as the Pistons were swept. Walls would have a great series, averaging over 17 rebounds and three blocks per game, but the deciding factor was an awful performance from Billups, in which he averaged less than 10 points on under 28% shooting. The Pistons were closer, but their season was over. And for the regular season, Wallace put up about 7 points, 15.5 rebounds, 3 blocks, and 1.5 steals per game. For the most part, these were the same Pistons going into 2004, but they would get much better years out of a couple young players, as Tayshawn Prince would become the team's starting small forward, and Mehmet Okur would provide great scoring off the bench but they also had a new coach in Larry Brown. Oh yeah, and they had drafted Darko Milicic second overall in this year's draft, but we won't talk about that. With Wallace anchoring the defense, they would finish with the league's second ranked scoring defense to make up for their bottom five scoring offense. Wallace's per game rebounds had dropped by three, but it was still enough for a top three finish in the league, and his career high 324 offensive rebounds would be second in the league. His final season of averaging at least three blocks per game would see him finish second in the league, while also finishing top 10 in steals. He would finish with the best defensive rating of his career to again lead the league, but he wouldn't capture a third straight DPOY, as he was the runner-up to the Pacers' Ron Artest. He would still be first team all defense and second team all NBA, while earning another all-star selection. This would be one of Wallace's best scoring seasons as well, as he averaged nearly 10 points per game, recording 43 games in double figures and 36 double doubles, as well as three games with at least 20 boards and defensively he would have 28 games with at least 4 blocks and 11 games with at least 4 steals, as he would even finish 7th in league MVP voting. And the Pistons were sitting at 34-22 and 22 on February 19th, but then would pull off a trade for their missing piece. Joe Dumars would address the team's glaring need by trading for Rasheed Wallace, a talented player with a turbulent past. Whatever I could bring to the table to, to help us make that gallop for that, for that title cup, you know, that's, that's what I'm gonna do. Detroit had acquired Rasheed Wallace at the trade deadline for next to nothing, as he would provide them with a player who could stretch the floor, score down low, and play defense. The Pistons would go 20 and six the rest of the way to finish at 54 and 28, where they would enter the playoffs with a first round matchup versus Milwaukee. And although they would drop a game, they would win the other four convincingly, as Wallace would record three double doubles and four games with at least 11 rebounds. As for the series, he would average a double-double, with over two and a half steals and blocks per game. The second round brought a conference finals rematch, but this time the Pistons would set the tone with two blowout wins. However, they would then drop the next three. Up to this point, Wallace had recorded three double-doubles, including 15 points and 24 rebounds, with 11 offensive rebounds in a Game 3 loss. But with their season on the line in Game 6, Wallace would pull down 20 rebounds in a Pistons win, then come back with 18 points and 8 rebounds on 8 of 10 shooting in a Game 7 win, as the Pistons were heading back to the Conference Finals, this time to face the Indiana Pacers. Wallace would have 11 points, 22 rebounds, and 5 blocks in a Game 1 loss, and record 2 double-doubles and average 4 blocks through the first 3 games. Then in Games 4 and 5, he would score a combined 2 points, yet average over 15 rebounds and 3 blocks, as the series went to a Game 7. And although Wallace would struggle, shooting just 6 of 16, he would still record 12 points and 16 rebounds, as the Pistons advanced to their first NBA Finals since 1990, where waiting for them would be the Lakers' attempt at a super team, featuring an aging Carl Malone and Gary Payton, alongside a dysfunctional Shaq and Kobe. Nonetheless, most thought that the Lakers just had too much star power, but the defense that Detroit had ridden to the Finals would be too much for LA. The teams would split the first two games, as Wallace would have 9 points and 8 rebounds in a Game 1 win, then 12 points and 14 rebounds in Game 2. After that, the Pistons' stifling defense held LA to below 90 points in each of the next three games. Wallace would gradually improve in these three games, as he had 7 and 11 in Game 3, then 8 and 13 in Game 4. But his best game of the series came in Game 5 with a chance to win the title as Wallace finished with 18 points on over 61% shooting, along with 3 steals and 22 rebounds, as the Pistons would win the game and the championship. Wallace's play was also notable for his defense on Shaq. Although he didn't shut down Shaq by any means, 
he played smart defense, as he only found himself in foul trouble during their Game 2 loss, as he would record no more than 3 fouls in any other game. But after community college, to a Division 2 school, to going undrafted, Wallace had already made a name for himself individually, but now he was a champion, and no one could take that away from him. And for the regular season, Wallace averaged about 9.5 points, 12.5 rebounds, 2 steals, and a block per game. Detroit continued to do all they could to keep their core together going into 05. They would re-sign Rashid Wallace, and even though they had lost Okur to free agency, they would bring in a capable replacement in Antonio McDice. The Pistons starting five was firmly established, and now they would get a full year with Rashid Wallace. And although Ben Wallace was the only member of the starting five not to average double figures, he was close, with a career-high 9.7 points per game. He was again near the top of the rebounding leaderboards and was a top offensive rebounder. However, this would be the first time in four years that Wallace didn't average at least three blocks per game, but he would still be top five in the league. His defensive rating had fallen to the third best in the league, but he would return to being recognized as the league's best, as he would be voted third team All-NBA, first team All-Defense, and win his third Defensive Player of the Year award, while also being voted to his third straight All-Star game. But Wallace would find himself in the middle of one of the most infamous moments in sports history early in the year. The Pistons started the year 4-3 and, and were on their way to a fourth loss versus the Indiana Pacers. But late in the fourth quarter, with the game well out of reach, Ron Artest committed a hard foul on Wallace. And according to then Pacers player Steven Jackson, this was a retaliation for something that had occurred in last year's conference finals. But this would lead to Wallace giving Artest a hard shove and a bit of a scuffle breaking out. But things would get back under control, and Artest was laying on the scorer's table. But after he was hit with a drink thrown from the stands, the malice at the palace would then occur, as Artest and other Pacers players stormed the stands and began fighting fans. Although the Pacers got the worst of the punishments, with Artest being suspended for the year, Wallace would receive the longest punishment out of any Pistons player, as he would be suspended six games before serving five of them. But when he returned to the lineup, he was the same old Big Ben as he had 29 double-doubles and 59 games with at least 10 rebounds, while recording 21 games with at least 4 blocks. The Pistons would finish with an identical record from last year at 54-28, and, and would get the Sixers in Round 1. This series would end in a 5-game Pistons win, with Wallace recording at least 10 rebounds in each game, and 3 double-doubles, as well as averaging over 2.5 blocks for the series. Ironically, the Pistons' only loss would come in Game 3, when Wallace recorded his postseason career high an overall highest point total of his entire playing career, when he had 29 points on 11 of 17 shooting, to go along with 16 rebounds. The second round brought the Pacers, who were still without our test. They would surprisingly go up 2-1 on Detroit, but then Detroit would win the next three to win the series. Wallace would start strong with 21 and 15 in game one, and again record at least 10 rebounds in all six games of the series, while averaging about two steals and over two blocks per game, and helping to hold Jermaine O'Neal to below 38% shooting. Wallace couldn't get away from Shaq, as the conference finals brought a new look Miami Heat team with a second year Dwayne Wade and newly acquired Shaquille O'Neal. Wallace wouldn't have the same rebounding impact this series, as he would have just 4 games with double digit rebounds, and the Pistons would go down 2-1, and after 5 games the Heat were up 3-2 with a chance to close it out at home, but an injury to Wade kept him out of game 6 as the Pistons won in a blowout, then went home with momentum to close it out in game 7. Wallace again had played notable defense on Shaq, as he would again only once get into foul trouble, but Shaq would still average an efficient 20 points. This time, the finals brought the San Antonio Spurs, led by Tim Duncan, Manu Ginobili, and Tony Parker. This would be another 7-game series, but it wouldn't end in Detroit's favor. Wallace would have a great finals, as he would average a double-double for the series on nearly 57% shooting and 3 blocks per game, and his defense was again on display, as he helped hold Tim Duncan to about 20 points per game on less than 42% shooting. Wallace would start the first two games slowly, but after that would score in double figures and record four double-doubles. They would go down 2-0 before evening the series at two games apiece, and then in the final seconds of overtime in Game 5, with Detroit up by two, a defensive mistake would leave Robert Ory wide open for a three, which he would drain to put the Spurs ahead and give them the win. The Pistons forced the Game 7, but would lose as they were not able to repeat as champions. But for the regular season, Wallace put up about 9.5 points, 12 rebounds, 1.5 steals, and 2.5 blocks per game. The Pistons again retained their elite core going into 06, but one change had been made, as Detroit had bought out Brown's contract and replaced him with Flip Saunders. However, this would prove to be a poor decision, as Saunders would butt heads with many players, but none more than Ben Wallace. 
Wallace's averages dipped across the board, but he would shoot over 50% for the first time in five years. Even with the lower averages, he maintained his elite defensive play and finished as a top five rebounder and was first in the NBA with 301 offensive rebounds while finishing in the top 10 in both steals and blocks per game. He would again have the third lowest defensive rating in the league as he would earn his fifth straight first team all defense selection and a second team all NBA selection, while also repeating his defensive player of the year for his fourth overall DPOI. He would record 17 double doubles and three games with at least 20 rebounds as he would be voted to his fourth consecutive yet final all-star game, which saw the Pistons send four out of five starters to the game. Even with a new coach, the Pistons looked like they were on a revenge tour throughout the regular season. They featured a top three scoring defense and would finish with a league best 64 and 18 record. The first round of the playoffs would bring the eight seed Milwaukee Bucks. And aside from losing game three in a blowout, the Pistons would easily handle the Bucks en route to a gentleman's sweep. But Wallace wasn't producing at his usual rate. Although he would have three games with double digit rebounds, he would have two with five or less. He would average just over a block per game and scored a combined 12 points across the five games while shooting 25%. The second round brought the Cavs and this series would be much closer. The Pistons would go up 2-0 as Wallace had his only double-double of the postseason with 10 points and 15 rebounds in game two. Then the Cavs would win three straight before Detroit took the final two games to win the series. Wallace would still have about 11 and a half rebounds per game but would average below two blocks and steals. The conference finals brought a rematch with the Heat but this time Miami got the better of Detroit. The series went six games, but after falling behind 3-1, it didn't look good for Detroit. And even though they rallied to force game six, they would lose in a blowout. Wallace had his most efficient offensive series as he averaged six and a half points on over 66% shooting, but he would fail to average double digit rebounds and record less than a block per game. And more importantly, the tensions between Saunders and Wallace reached their boiling point as Wallace refused to re-enter in the fourth quarter of game six. So Detroit's fourth straight conference finals appearance would not lead to a third straight NBA finals appearance. But now they were worried about whether they'd be able to bring back their franchise star, who was a free agent going into the offseason. Wallace would sign with the Chicago Bulls for five years, 60 million. And although money talks, as Chicago offered him more than Detroit, it was likely an easier decision to make, knowing that he wouldn't have to play for Flip Saunders anymore. So instead, he would play for the no-nonsense Scott Skiles, who had some interesting team rules such as players not being allowed to wear headbands or play loud music, both rules which Wallace would break this year. A 32-year-old Wallace was now the elder statesman on a young, scrappy Bulls team, featuring guys like Kirk Heinrich, Ben Gordon, and Luol Deng, as Wallace was hoped to not only bring a defensive presence, but also set an example as a player with a reputation for being one of the hardest working guys in the league. But it became apparent quite early that although Wallace was still effective, this was a player in the early stages of his decline, but you also need to consider that he was in a whole different system that relied on fast-paced play, which likely didn't suit a player his age or one coming from Detroit, who had been one of the slowest-paced teams for years. Wallace still ranked as a top 10 rebounder in the league, and his 303 offensive rebounds would be the second highest total, but this would be his final season averaging double-digit rebounds. He would finish in the top 20 in blocks and steals, this would also be his final season averaging at least two blocks per game. He would record just 12 double doubles in 77 games, but would have a 27 rebound game in a December 15th win versus Milwaukee. But overall, he would still have the second lowest defensive rating in the league, yet was no longer an all NBA player or all star, but he would earn a spot on the second team all defense. The Bulls showed an improved defense and finished at 49 and 33, where they would get a first round matchup with Miami. And although Miami hadn't performed well during their championship defense, people weren't expecting Chicago to sweep them. Wallace would have a good series as he put up about 9.5 points and 10 rebounds, along with 1.5 steals and blocks per game, while also helping to hold Shaq below 19 points per game. As the Bulls would move on to face Wallace's former team in round two, Chicago would push this series to six games, but the top-seeded Pistons were too much. Wallace put up similar numbers with about 8.5 points and 9.5 rebounds on over 58% shooting, but the backcourt of Heinrich and Gordon struggled as Chicago cracked 90 points just once in the series. And for the regular season, Wallace put up about 6.5 points, 10.5 rebounds, and 2 blocks per game. The Bulls were hoping to build on their 2007, but that would not happen. After a 9-16 start, Skiles was let go, and overall the Bulls would have 3 coaches this year. But then on February 21st, with Wallace in the middle of the worst season of his career, putting up career lows across the board, and failing to crack 38% shooting, he would be sent to the Cleveland Cavaliers 
Wallace would join superstar LeBron James, and a Cavs team not featuring much else outside of James and center Zydrunas Ilgauskas. And with Ilgauskas playing the five, Wallace would be shifted to power forward for the remainder of the year. Wallace's numbers would drop further during his 22 games for the Cavs, but he was able to shoot over 45% and was getting over six less minutes per game. The Cavs would finish the year at 45 and 37 and face a hobbled Wizards team in round one, who they would defeat in six games. Wallace was still able to average over a block per game, but he would have just one game with double digit rebounds and would fail to score in double figures for the entire postseason. The Cavs would play the Celtics and their new big three in round two. And although this series went the distance, the Celtics came out on top. Wallace's numbers wouldn't jump off the page, but he was able to provide solid defensive minutes on Kevin Garnett. But for the regular season, Wallace put up about five points, eight and a half rebounds, and one and a half blocks per game. The Cavs brought in Mo Williams for the 09 season, and Wallace would spend the entire year with Cleveland. However, he wouldn't play the entire year. Wallace would break his leg in a February 26th game versus Houston, and would only appear in three games for the rest of the regular season. A season in which he saw a further dip in his numbers, as he recorded just nine games with double digit rebounds and no double doubles. But Wallace was back for the playoffs and would get some revenge on his former team, as the Cavs swept the Pistons in round one. But Wallace came off the bench all postseason in limited minutes, as he would have just one block and eight rebounds across the four games. They would then sweep Atlanta in round two, as Wallace again recorded eight rebounds and a block over the four games. The conference finals brought the Magic, and after splitting the first two games, the Magic went up 3-1 before taking the series in six. Wallace was given a larger role, and although he produced more, it was still minimal, as his best performance saw him rack up four points and six rebounds in a game three loss. And for the regular season, he would average about three points, six and a half rebounds, and a block and a half per game. During the offseason, Wallace was traded to the Suns as part of a package to acquire Shaquille O'Neal. But just a few weeks later, he would be bought out by Phoenix and would make his return to Detroit when he signed with the Pistons about a month after that. Wallace would choose to wear number six instead of his better known number three, which was being worn by Rodney Stuckey, as this would kick off his twilight years. 2010 would see Wallace as the team's starting center, and he had moments where he looked more like his old self. He would put up his best numbers since his first year in Chicago, and would even shoot a career-high 54.1%. The Pistons looked very different from when Wallace was last there, but would still feature Prince and Hamilton, although they would both miss significant time this year. Wallace would record 25 games with at least 10 rebounds, and his final career 20 rebound game. But the Pistons were no longer an Eastern Conference powerhouse, as they would finish the year at 27-55 and, and miss the playoffs. And for the regular season, Wallace put up about 5.5 points, 8.5 rebounds, and a block per game. 2011 would be much of the same. The Pistons would get a healthier year out of Prince, but Hamilton would again miss a lot of time. Wallace continued to be mostly a starter when he did play, but would only manage 54 games this year. And although he averaged less than three points, he would score his regular season career high of 23 points on 10 of 13 shooting in a December 11th loss to Toronto. But the Pistons didn't improve much as they finished 30 and 52 and missed the playoffs again. And for the regular season, Wallace put up about three points, six and a half rebounds, and a block and steal per game. 2012 would be Wallace's last. Hamilton was gone, leaving just Wallace and Prince as the only members of the championship team with young guys like big man Greg Monroe and the backcourt of Rodney Stuckey and Brandon Knight, the Pistons were a new team, and Wallace was now playing a veteran role and coming off the bench. Wallace had minimal contributions for a 25-41 and 41 Pistons team, who again missed the playoffs. But for the regular season, he averaged about 1.5 points, 4.5 rebounds, and a block. And that would be it for the career of the greatest undrafted player of all time. Ben Wallace did nothing but work to get where he got and have the success that he did. He was undersized, yet played like the biggest guy on the court. With his hustle, timing, and toughness, he carved out one of the greatest defensive careers in the history of the game. You knew he had something special about him from the glimpses he got to show early in his career. He just needed the opportunity. When he finally got that in Detroit, he put together an unprecedented six-year stretch, as without him, Detroit more than likely never makes it out of the East. He led by example, and it was hoped he could continue to do that as a prized free agent for Chicago. But being an aging player in a much faster system, he started to slow down, and while he was still effective, it wasn't the standard fans were used to. Then the rest of his career would be as more of a role player, but he was still giving productive minutes and maximum effort until the end. One of the underappreciated defensive greats, who deservedly made the Hall of Fame, yet somewhat surprisingly was left off of the top 75. Ben Wallace is a player you couldn't help but root for, and one that could change the course of any game. But that's it for today's episode on Big Ben. 
Hope you enjoyed it and make sure to subscribe for more videos like this one. If you liked it, check out this one on one of his teammates with the same last name. Or this one on another Wallace who played elite defense. Thanks for watching and see you next time.